will now move into the next panel, which is by Joanne McAndrews and Robert Barwick. The, this is dealing with a credit system for Australia, the American system precedent, King O'Malley and Australia's National Bank. So I'll hand over to Joanne and Robbie. So yes, my name is Joanne McAndrews, and as many of you have pointed out to me, I have a bit of a Yankee accent. <laughs> but I just would like to set the record straight. I am a born and bred Australian, <laughs> but I've spent the last uh, nine years, and currently I'm still living in the United States, working with the LaRouche movement in the US. Um, and during that time, I've had a lot of opportunities to study American history and uh, particularly do some work on this whole Jackson period that we've looked into now. Uh, this is the pamphlet that was recently published in the United States, How Jackson Destroyed the United States, uh, which details the fight around the Second Bank of the United States and how Jackson vetoed the recharter of the bank. Um, over Congress, right? Congress had voted for the bank to be rechartered for another 30 years. Jackson stepped in and said no. And then before the vote could go back to Congress, because if a president vetoes something, and then the Congress again passes the exact same legislation a second time, then they override the president's veto. But uh, Congress went out of session before they got to re-vote on the recharter. So they lost the bank, and then Jackson removed all the deposits from the bank which crushed the institution um, and, and forced a lot of, I mean, it forced a depression, but uh, it just destroyed people's ability to borrow credit for industry, uh, for industrial purposes. So, uh, but to begin, I just wanted to, you know, the, the title of this conference, Toward a Nobler Manhood and a Public Credit System. Now, you can look at this and say, Toward a, toward a uh, noble manhood and the public credit system as two separate things. We're going to do this and we're going to do this. The point I want to make is that it is through the public credit system that you get to the noble manhood. Um, and so just to, just to recap from some of this stuff, particularly from Elisa's presentation, right? this fight around you know, Kuz's push for the, the concepts of the nation state, the question of the common good, and the general welfare, the development of all man. Um, and just to point out that one of the big things in that time period is that it, it was not deemed that everybody should have access to education. And this is one of the, the, the big things that came with the Renaissance is that every individual had the right to be educated. Um, and when the nation state was established in England under Henry VII, you had people like Thomas More, Erasmus, um, these guys, you know, that was one of the first things that they did, is it was, okay, we're going to give everyone education, we're going to start these school systems. Um, women, as well as men, it wasn't just the men. Um, and so it was this idea and uh, that everybody has this right. Um, and so that shifted in England, right? The nation state got crushed in England through this Venetian sapi takeover where they said, okay, we will, we'll let you have knowledge but we're not going to give you access to the method by which you discover it. We're going to force you to think from the standpoint that you can only know truth through your senses, that there is, there's nothing beyond the senses. Um, and it was, it was this fight that, that played out in England. Um, the point of disintegration was when Henry VIII chopped off the head of Thomas More. Right? Thomas More was the highest intellectual figure in the country. He also held the highest legal office in the country. And, Tom, uh, and, and Henry VIII chopped off his head, and that was it. England was heading downhill from that point on. And so this all kind of culminated around the this, this early 1600s um, where this, this, this question of Cusa, uh, the question of Columbus's discovery of America, Right, you had people in England pushing for new colonies in America, and it was this concept of we've got to create a new world. We've got to get the hell out of Europe. It's depravity. It's you know, it's slavery. You can't develop. We need somewhere to start afresh and take these most, you know, the most noble ideas of man and try and implement them in a society 
as far away from, from oligarchy as you can get. Um, and so in 1620, you had the, the first uh, Mayflower, the Mayflower sailed to the, to the Americas, and this was the establishment of the, the Plymouth colony. And then in 1630, you had uh, the Massachusetts Company sail on the flagship Arabella. Um, just a quick show of hands, did any people know about the Massachusetts Bay Colony? Much of the history, a little bit? Okay, good. Um, now the thing, the thing about the, the flagship Arabella is that they were sailing with a document that gave them self-charter. Every, you had other colonies, the Virginia colonies had been around for a while, even the Plymouth colony. You know, they, these colonies existed in America, but their, the final decisions were being made in England. And it was usually done through like a board of directors for the company, and they would make the final decision. But with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they went with a self-charter. They'd cut a deal before they left, and they had, uh, they had the document in their hands that said they have the right to make their own decisions. Now, to give you a sense of what their intention was, um, we'll start with the first slide. This is, it was, this is, this is from John Winthrop. He's a Puritan minister. These were the Puritans. It was religious for whoever asked that question last night. The Winthrops, the Mathers, they were all Puritan uh, ministers. But, um, yeah, so this is what they said. This is while they're sailing there. This is, I mean, you know, I don't know how many months it took them to get there, but, you know, there was always shipwrecks, and it was a very terrifying expedition. But here's what Winthrop says to the people on board Arabella. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. When he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, May the Lord make it like that of New England. But we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So they went, they knew explicitly that they were an example to the rest of mankind, that this was an experiment to take these great ideas that had been developed throughout the Renaissance and actually apply them in a system of government that allows for the development of all citizens. Um, now, I want to jump ahead, go to the next slide. So that was 1630. 1788, you had the creation of the Constitution of the United States. And here's the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. And you can't, there is a, there is a connection from the Massachusetts Bay Colony all the way through 150 years later to the actual creation of the Constitution of the United States. And there's many battles along the way to actually get there. And so, but before we look at uh, some more of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, I want to point out that this concept of America being a great experiment and this understanding of leaving Europe, coming to America, creating the new world, uh, this is something that is embodied in the best figures throughout American history. 
the best leaders, uh, Lincoln, right? The government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Um, from Nicholas Biddle, who is the second president, or the sorry, the president of the Second Bank of the United States, uh, to John F. Kennedy, Eleanor Roosevelt, they understood this history, and when they the, when they took up leadership, it was this history that they they were set about to continue. So uh, here's something that Nicholas Biddle said. He wrote a paper as a youth called On the Discovery of America. And the paper is about how Columbus sought a new continent to provide a refuge for men seeking to escape the despotism and selfish princes, the religious inquisition, and the general depravity of Europe. The free and independent-minded men came to the new world, and those, who decided, and those who desired to be slaves remained behind. So that's Biddle, Second Bank of the United States president. Uh, next slide, John F. Kennedy. When he, uh, he's from Massachusetts, so the day that he was leaving to go assume his position in the White House, he gave a speech uh, to the, the council in, in Massachusetts. Here's what he says. For no man about to enter high office in this country can ever be unmindful of the contribution this state has made to our national greatness. Its leaders have shaped our destiny long before the great republic was born. Its principles have guided our footsteps in times of crisis as well as in times of calm. Its democratic institutions, including this historic body, have served as beacon lights for other nations as well as our sister states. For what Pericles said to the Athenians has long been true of this commonwealth. We do not imitate, for we are a model to others. I have been guided by the standard John Winthrop set before his shipmates on the flagship Arabella 331 years ago, as they too faced the task of building a new government on a perilous frontier. We must always consider, he said, that we shall be as a city upon the hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Um, now I just want to jump to Eleanor Roosevelt because I think she captures the, the fight that took place to establish this new government in a certain sense. So, Look back at the American continent of the 17th century. Primeval forest, gigantic mountain ranges, turbulent rivers, vast plains, savage animals, and even more savage men a land that has remained basically unchanged from the beginning of time. That was what our ancestors faced after the terrors of a long and dangerous sea voyage, sailing away from the only world they knew, the only way of life of which they had any experience, sailing into the unknown, the unforeseeable. But they brought with them courage and hope. They brought determination and a vision of a better life. They were fired by a desire to create a new kind of civilization, without fear or oppression, where men could develop freely and fully their best abilities and capabilities and capacities. They brought with them, too, faith in Christian justice and in a system of equitable law. And because they believed in these things with all their hearts, they planted them in the new soil where they flourished and built a new world. They made their own history. There were mistakes, of course. The creation of something new under the sun must always suffer to some degree from the process of trial and error. But almost from the beginning, the nature of this new structure began to fire the imagination of the world. It became apparent that with sufficient courage, with undimmed faith in their values, men could create a world of freedom and justice in which to live. But the newcomers did not stop with creating a new kind of government and a new way of life. They were not willing to confine the great adventure to the eastern seaboard. They set out to explore and tame a continent, to tunnel its mountains and bridge its rivers, to make its land yield food and its forests provide shelter. And so this was the basis in which the Massachusetts Bay Colony was established, committed to the common good of all members of the colony, committed to economic and industrial development, uh, and as as Eleanor says, make the land yield food and the forest provide shelter. So with a, sh with a charter for self-government, the colony could actually set out to create its own form of government, its own set of policies. 
And so they did everything possible to encourage economic development and, and, and provide for the general welfare. So they established subsidies for local manufacture of textiles, uh, especially for outfitting uh, of a fleet. Uh, measures were passed to stimulate things like the production of hemp, and a 21-year tax exemption was given to anybody who discovered mines. Now, by, nine, uh, by 1646, the colony had established the first fully integrated iron works in North America, called the Sorgas Iron Works. Uh, John Winthrop Jr. had been sent back to London to recruit men and materials, the skilled labor and the materials needed to start the iron works, and the General Court of Massachusetts gave the iron works a 21-year monopoly, the necessary lands needed, and a 10-year tax, ex tax exemption on condition that it was a complete iron works, that it, that it covered everything from blast furnaces and forges to rolling and slitting mills. And the company, they're they restricted. They were told, you will only be permitted to export the iron you produce once the needs of the colony were met. Now, after the first year of operation, the Sorgas Iron Works was producing eight tons of wrought iron per week, which was outproducing the best iron works back in, back in England. Um, because in the old world, wealth was increased by stealing it. You invaded another country. You sent out pirates to, you know, you know the English would send out ships to go and uh, capture the Spanish ships that were full of treasures. Um, and that was, that was your concept of wealth creation. You just got, went and got it, stole it from somewhere else. But in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the emphasis was that, it, you know, that in the New World, wealth is increased through your labor. Um, part of this, that it was a huge emphasis on education. Um, within 10 years of, of landing in Massachusetts, they had already set up a compulsory elementary education system and also uh, publicly supported academies for further college preparation and higher education. Uh, in, in 1643, the Massachusetts Bay, the Plymouth colonies, and the Connecticut River colonies uh, began to work together, and they created the New England Confederation. Um, so they began to look at the development of the larger area and bring in more colonies. And the further, the more that they did this, the more angry England became. I mean, they were trying to get that charter back, I think, within like five years of the, of the landing of the colony. Um, but the, the, the guys in the colony were like, oh, sorry, our general court's not meeting until next year, so come back and ask us about that charter question later. Um, so a further point of sovereignty came in 1652 when the colony began minting its own currency. Um, and this is the pine tree shilling. And this is a big deal because, you know, the king had all control over currency. And uh, the fact that they minted it themselves was, was a big deal. Now, 1652, Charles I had been beheaded. So technically there wasn't a king. So under that, and uh, actually they minted the coins for 30 years, and every coin that they minted has the same date, 1652. <laughs> plausible deniability. Um, you know, and they had to do this because if they wanted to increase their trade and their industry, they needed a means of exchange. The barter system was just too inefficient, right? But coin was so scarce, England didn't like sending it over to the colony, and then you had the Civil War, which made it even worse because all the coin was, was in uh, England. So they said, all right, we're going to mint our own. We're going to create our own currency. And this is something I've been looking into because Mr. LaRouche has stated, he said, look, the, the credit system of the Hamilton system is embedded in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the pine tree shilling. And from what we've done on the Jackson, because Andrew Jackson's big fight was he wanted to get rid of the paper currency and he forced everything to go back to transactions using gold and silver um, and really messed up things in, in the United States at that point. But his whole argument was that you couldn't use credit um, we're going to make everyone pay in specie. Um, so to me, I said, well, the pine tree shilling is still a, still a form of specie. So how does this equate to the Hamilton credit system? And so in looking into that, what I discovered is that uh, not long after they minted the, the currency, that they actually created a credit fund in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. 
but let's just go, the next slide here uh, is on this question of why credit is preferable to money. And this is from uh, a guy, Robert Hare, who wrote, wrote a paper called Proofs That Credit Is Money in a Truly Free Country Is to a Great Extent Preferable to Coin. The man who enjoys the one has nearly an equal facility with him who commands the other in the purchase of materials for trade or manufacture. But the stimulus to industry or exertion is very different in the two cases. The mechanic who has $100 can live without work so long as it lasts. He may spend the whole or part in his pleasures or for his sustenance and may work proportionally less. But the, man, the, but the mechanic who can command credit to the amount of $100 has nearly the same capacity to earn money as the other, but his privilege will not sustain him in idleness. Um, so you use your credit as a way to promote the industrious activity of your citizens. Um, so yeah, they experimented with uh, what was called the fund. This was a, a group of merchants came together and said, look, we've got to figure out this thing about how to not have to use specie at all. Let's just use a form of credit. So they joined together, created the fund, said, all right, in all of our uh, exchanges between us, we're not going to use specie. We will just transfer credit uh, through this joint fund um, and experiment with it. And then by 1681... Um, Sorry, that was 1681. By 1686, there was an actual official proposal for a bank of credit. And they explicitly said that we want to get away from just being restricted by specie because they couldn't do enough as a colony. They couldn't develop enough. There was stu still too much of a restriction based on whether you could get access to gold or silver to be able to trade with one another. Um, so some of the comments from these papers, and we, we don't have the full details of this, is something we've just realized recently, is that these banks of credits were being experimented with in the colony itself. Um, but one of the papers, they just state, a bank which should furnish a means of transacting business through its credit without the use of money. The credit passed in fund by book and bills will supply the defect of money. Um, so... Like in the old world, they use a system of specie. The emphasis is on accumulating as much specie as you can get. They wanted to, in the, in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, look uh, to use credit as a way to put the emphasis on, on industry and development. Um, and apparently, the, this credit bank was approved. Um, we don't have documents of the bank actually going into existence. It's not clear whether it was actually officially set up or not. I'm going to do some more work on that. But, but it was definitely something that the colony had agreed that, yes, we should, we should do this. We should experiment with it. Um, so how are we doing for time? Um, OK, I just want to bring up some uh, ben Franklin here. This is a little bit, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but this, he has a paper on uh, a modest proposal for a paper currency. They were using paper currency by the time of Ben Franklin. This is uh, 1729. But they were still using specie as well, and his argument is that we should, we should move more towards a paper currency. Um, and so he had a, this document that details why, why he's saying that. Um, so he says, it would be very tedious if there were no other way of general dealing but by an immediate exchange of commodities, because a man that had corn to dispose of and wanted cloth for it might perhaps, in search for a chapman to deal with, meet with 20 people that had cloth to dispose of but wanted no corn, and with 20 others that wanted his corn but had no cloth to suit him with. To remedy such inconveniences and facilitate exchange, men have invented money properly called a medium of exchange, because through or by its means, labor is exchanged for labor, or one commodity for another. For many ages, those parts of the world which are engaged in commerce have fixed upon gold and silver as the chief and proper materials for this medium, they being in themselves valuable metals for their finesse, beauty, and scarcity. By these, particularly silver, it has been usual to value all things else. But as silver itself is no certain permanent value, being worth more or less according to its scarcity or plenty, 
Therefore, it seems requisite to fix upon something else, more proper to be made a measure of values. And this I take to be labor. By labor may the value of silver be measured as well as other things. As suppose one man employed to raise corn while another is digging and refining silver, at the year's end or any other period of time, the complete produce of corn and that of silver are the natural price of each other. And if one be 20 bushels and the other 20 ounces, then an ounce of that silver is worth the labor of raising a bushel of that corn. Thus, the riches of a country are to be valued by the quantity of labor as its inhabitants are able to purchase and not by the quantity of silver and gold they possess. Okay, so we're going to jump ahead here. December 16th, 1773. Does that date ring a bell to anybody? December 16th, 1773. Not even Robbie Barwick. <laughs> Stumped him. <laughs> this is the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> now, <laughs> it wasn't just about taxes. Um, so 1773, this is the Boston Tea Party. Now, in 1772, they'd had an India Act in the British Parliament. This brought the East India Company officially into the British government for the first time. It allowed the East India Company to appoint uh, members to the British Board of Trade, and it allowed the government to appoint members to the East India Company's Board of Directors. So the British East India Company and the British government became one and the same entity. And, of course, the British East India Company is looting the hell out of every, every place they can get access to, um, and one of the things of this India Act is that the company was granted a monopoly on the India trade for the next 50 years. Um, now, since the 1760s, the, the British had been using various acts to create taxes on the colonies, Stamp Act, the Iron Act. Um, it was a way for them to restrict the development of America. And in 1773, they introduced a tax on tea. Now, already in the 60s, the, the colonial leadership, and this, this wasn't just Massachusetts now, this was the Virginia colonies, well, Pennsylvania, um, your whole colonies in the United States were saying, well, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, we can produce this stuff ourselves, so why, why should we be subjugated to these taxes? So they actually created a policy, uh, the non-importation movement, whereby no English-made goods would be bought in trade. And Americans would make what they needed, including clothing, tools, iron, paper. Uh, and there was pretty much a universal decision to refuse to drink English tea. So the, Indi the East India Company was not happy. Um, they said, that's it. We've got to break the back of these, these American colonies, and we're going to use the tea to do it. We'll, we'll give them tea so cheap that they can't help but buy it from us. Um, so they, they were trying to force the hands of the Americans, and in 1773, they tried desperately to land these shipments of tea, because to collect the tax, all they had to do was land the tea in the, in, in the Americas. All they had to do was it had to be offloaded at the dock. Um, so first of all, they went to Philadelphia, docked there. Philadelphia refused. We will not unload you. Get your ships out of our harbor. We don't want your tea. So then they went to New York. Same thing happened. Get the hell out of here. We're not interested. And so then by the time that had happened, the, the Philadelphia and New York had gotten word to Boston and said, hey, they're coming your way. Be, be ready. Um, and so when they got to Boston, there was a huge standoff. And they said, no, 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 we're not going to unload this tea. We don't want it. And they said, well, these ships will not leave your harbor until you do it. And the British East India Company actually brought in warships prepared to fire on their own ships that were holding the tea that if they tried to leave the harbor without the tea being unloaded, they would fire on the ships, <laughs> right? Because, you know, the poor captains of the ships are like, okay, they don't want us, let's get the hell out of here. Um, anyway, so in the end, they said, all right, fine, we'll unload the tea. Now, so they unloaded it. They went in and they took it all and they threw it into the harbor. <laughs> and... So it was unloaded, but it wasn't docked, so therefore we're not paying the tax, and uh, you guys can go to hell. <laughs> so in 
So this was the point, this was the point of no return in the war, in the battle for independence. At this point, there was, there was just no turning back. Um, and they, they knew that they were, they were in trouble, that the British weren't going to take this lightly. So immediately, well, in the next year, they actually established the Continental Congress because they figured, well, these colonies, we're going to have to join together here if we have any chance of actually beating the British as they unleash on us because of our, our uh, misbehavior. And so this led into July 4th, 1776. Oh, that's the Boston Tea Party. Ooh, next one. Forgot about those. Um, Declaration of Independence. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from it. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Right, that's Kuz's principle that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing it, its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And then they list a long list of complaints, all of the things that have been denied them by the king. And they end the declaration saying, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rest, restitute of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are abolished from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thus began the War of Independence. <clears throat> so you've got the 13 states um, are now brought together as, you know, under this confederation. And this is where the, the whole question of the, the development of a nation as a nation really begins to come to fruition. And this is where Hamilton comes in. And Hamilton was a chief of staff to, to General Washington. Um, I guess not long after they declared the, the War of Independence, or the declared independence, that they assigned George Washington the task of heading up uh, the military forces of the 13 colonies. Um, but each colony had its own militia, right? So you're dealing with a situation where each of these colonies had been acting individually. They had their own militia to protect their colony, but now you're trying to bring these colonies together to fight for the common good of all colonies, right? to fight for their collective independence. Um, and so now I just want to, uh, I mean, Hamilton starts dealing with this. I mean, he's 22 years old, chief of staff to General Washington, but he's seeing that the, the, the formation of the Continental Congress isn't sufficient to actually ensure their independence because this isn't good enough. We don't have the powers necessary. Um, and just I'll just read this one quote from him here. We're going to go through a few. But he says, that body, meaning the, the Continental Congress that's being set up, um, is no doubt chargeable with mistakes. But perhaps its greatest has been too much readiness to make concessions of the powers implied in its original trust. 
This is partly to be attributed to an excessive compl complacence to the spirit which has evidently actuated a majority of the states, a desire of monopolizing all power in themselves. Congress has been responsible for the administration of affairs without the means of fulfilling that responsibility. Um, then he says, we ought... Um, is this the right one? Yeah, I think it's back the one before. We, okay. we ought, therefore, not only to strain every nerve for complying with the requisitions to render the present campaign as decisive as possible, but we ought without delay to enlarge the powers of Congress. Every plan of which this is not the foundation will be illusory. The separate exertions of the states will never suffice. Nothing but a well-proportioned exertion of the resources of the whole under the direction of a common council with power sufficient, sufficient to give efficacy to their resolutions can preserve us from being a conquered people now or can make us a happy people hereafter. And, I mean, this is the thing that he starts looking at is the defects of our present system. Uh, in a letter to James Duane, this is 1780, he says, the Confederation gives the states individually too much influence in the affairs of the army. They should have nothing to do with it. The entire formation and disposal of our military forces ought to belong to Congress. It is an essential cement of the Union, and it ought to be the policy of Congress to destroy all ideas of state attachments in the army and make it look wholly up to them. It may be apprehended that this may be dangerous to liberty. But nothing appears more evident to me than that we run a much greater risk of having a weak and disunited federal government than one which will be able to usurp upon the rights of the people. Already, some of the lines of the army would obey their states in opposition to Congress. The forms of our state constitutions must always give them great weight in our affairs and will make it too difficult to bend them to the pursuit of a common interest too easy to oppose whatever they do not like and to form partial combination sub subversive to the general one. In our case, that of an empire composed of confederated states, each with a government completely organized within itself, having all the means to draw its subjects to a close dependence on itself, the danger is that the common sovereign will not have the power sufficient to unite the different members together and direct the common forces to the interest and happiness of the whole. Now, I just want to use the example of Australia. <laughs> Think of Lance Endersby's proposal for a ring rail around Australia. I mean, Lance always recounted the story of, you know, you'd go to one state government, and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, this would be a great idea. You can have it as long as you use our port. And you say, well, no, we want the ring rail to you know, go all the way up to Darwin to use the most efficient means of transportation in the country. It's the closest port to Jakarta. You know, we want it all to go up through there. So then you go to Queensland, and Queensland says, yeah, this is a great idea as long as you use our ports as the, as the point. Um, take the example of even the fight in World War II. Right? Uh, they had to, I think this was under Menzies? Yeah, under the Menzies government, they had to pass the National Security Act in order to give the federal government the power to actually organize and direct the entire forces of the nation to actually defend ourselves in World War II. Um, and you had a big fight at the end of World War II uh, after the war ended because the National Security Act only gave them basically to the end of the war. Once the war was done, then those powers of national government that are dissolved. And they had a refer there was a referendum to try and expand those powers for five years following the war so that you could actually have a national coordination of the post-war, you know, bringing all the troops home, coming out of war production into peacetime production. And uh, I don't know whether people know, but it was fully supported. It was uh, passed by parliament. But then they had a referendum vote, and it was voted down in referendum. So they lost those powers. Um, and maybe we'll get into this on the Snowy Mountains, but it's a similar thing. To build the Snowy Mountains scheme, they had to use that National Security Act to do it because it was the only way you could have a national project. So they had to use the excuse of national defense 
because otherwise the laws don't exist whereby you can actually have a national direction of the development of your country. And so this is the problem they're running into during the, the War of Independence. We're going to get our asses kicked here if we can't mobilize the entire forces of the nation as one whole. We have this Continental Congress. It's got powers. But the states still have their own powers. So we have a little bit of a problem. So Hamilton says, and this is a letter to Robert Morris. Robert Morris is uh, made the superintendent of finance in 1781. Hamilton and Morris have been going back and forth for quite a period of time. But he says, uh, I am happy in believing you, uh, I am happy in believing you will not easily be discouraged from undertaking an office by which you may render America and the world no less a service than the establishment of American independence. It is by introducing order into our finances, by restoring public credit, not by gaining battles, that we are finally to gain our object. It is by putting ourselves in a position to continue the war, not by temporary violent and unnatural effort to bring it to a decisive issue, that we shall in reality bring it to a speedy and successful one. By public credit? You're gonna win the war by public credit? Right, their credit was so poor that, the, that they couldn't get loans from anywhere. Right? France didn't want to lend them money. Uh, the wealthy merchant, merchants inside the Americas, they had the money, but they weren't going to loan it to the government. So we don't trust that you have the means to pay this back. Um, so Hamilton's saying, look, our, you know, we, we have to establish the, the public credit of the country. So he says, to surmount these obstacles and give individuals ability and inclination to lend in any proportion to the wants of government, a plan must be devised which, by incorporating their means together and uniting them with those of the public, will, on the foundation of that incorporation and union, erect a massive credit that will supply the defect of moneyed capital and answer all the purposes of cash. I mean the institution of a national bank. And in this letter... Hamilton lays out the articles of what became the Bank of North America. Uh, six days after he writes the letter, the bill's being passed and the, the bank's being chartered. Um, it was the first private commercial bank. They had a stock of three million pounds, 30,000 shares at $100 each, to be exempted from all public taxes as a way to encourage people to invest in the bank. Um, the bank was to lend Congress 1,200,000 pounds to be paid off at 110,400 pounds per year over 20 years, and the states were to pledge themselves for the money. So they were creating a national debt, which all of the states would then be responsible for paying back, um, that they could then use that funding for the American Revolution. 63% uh, of the shares were actually purchased by the government because Robert Morris used the a loan that they got from France to buy shares in the bank. Um, they deposited gold, silver, bills of exchange from loans from the Netherlands and France into the bank, and then he issued a new paper currency that was backed by the deposits of the National Bank. Um, they would take the deposits from the public and they would lend money, uh, and they'd lend money directly to the, to the public as well. So just another quote here from Hamilton. He says, Congress must deal plainly with their constituents. They must tell them that power without revenue is a bubble that unless they give them substantial resources of the latter, they will not have enough of the former either to prosecute the war or to maintain the union in peace. That in short, they must, in justice to the public and to their own honor, renounce the vain attempt of carrying on the war without either, a, uh, without either, a perseverance in which can only deceive the people and betray their safety. Right? The states didn't want to give up all their, their leadership. They said, we still want to have our own self-government in these states. And so that, and this was a fight that they had to really work through. And it was through this Bank of North America that they unified the states through creating this, what became a public debt, a national debt, because this is a private bank. And that private bank is lending money to the, to the government so that you can actually fund the, the Revolutionary War and that debt is going to be paid back by the state. So the states had to work together. They had a, a, this that they had to actually pay back. Um, and then Hamilton says, a national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. It will be a powerful cement of our union. 
It will also create a necessity for keeping up taxation to a degree which, without being oppressive, will be a spur to industry, remote as we are from Europe and shall be from danger. It were otherwise to be feared, our popular maxims would incline us to too great parsimony and indulgence. We labor less now than any civilized nation of Europe, and a habit of labor in the people is as essential to the health and vigor of their minds and bodies as it is conducive to the welfare of the state. We ought not to suffer our self-love to deceive us in a comparison upon these points. He says they were laboring less as a nation than the nations of Europe. He says we don't want people sitting around idle. Let's put them to work. Um, so yeah, they created the bank to secure the credit necessary to win their independence. Now once the war was won, then everyone's like, oh, well, the war's won. We don't have to pay those debts back now, do we? Um, and you, so you had this, uh, when they actually, they had the official constitutional convention in 1787, um, right? And they fought, they said, look, we have to establish a national government, right? So this fight was still taking place. Um, but that's, you know, yeah, this is where they had to say, okay, we've, we've got to create a new government that's better than what we had as the Articles of Confederation because there's not enough power for the, for the Congress. There's still too much emphasis on the individual states. Uh, and it's the fight. It's the fight between the one and the, one and the many. Um, but yeah, so they use this, this banking question. Um, and I just want to go back to the, the preamble of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So this is 1787. But still, as I said, they have all these debts from the Revolutionary War, so they're now still, they now got a new government, and it's funny, they actually, some a lot of people said, well, hey, those are debts from the from the, uh, the Confederation. We're, we've got a new government now. We don't need to pay those debts back, right? And this is where Hamilton, Hamilton stepped in again. He said, no, it's the debts that unify us. And he said, we have to pay back those debts because that was the cost of our independence. It's worth paying for. You didn't mind getting your independence, so pay the expense for it. That's what we labored for. So let's, you know, let's continue that commitment. Um, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't long into the, the new, the new uh, Congress that they established the first bank of the United States. Again, to unify the nation through creating a national debt to fund the internal development of the nation. Um, and so, yes, I'll just give a plug. People should check out the how, the Jack, how Jackson destroyed the United States. It goes a lot more into the fight, the first and second banks. And there's also the uh, draft legislation that has been written to restore the original Bank of the United States. Um, so I think I will, well, I'll just make the final point that it was the use of credit to secure the future of the nation. There's an intention, where we want to go, where, where do we want to be 100 years from now? And it's through the use of the credit system that you're, an, you're able to actually enable the development of your nation as a whole. Um, not as some kind of individualistic standpoint. So I'll leave it there.